all the rest of it. Here are the LCVPs, which are 30 man boats, which carry the majority of the assault troops. And in the background are troop ships and another one of the LCVPs coming in. Oh, okay. Uh, typical of one of the many ships that they had. Here's an LST, which lands tanks right on the pond. Here's the bow. They land up on the, on the beach and the tanks would roll up. Okay. Again, another look at the uh, uh, typical ship. Okay. Now, this is slapped on sands in England, and it is as close as they could come to some of the, the, the cliffs that we were going to face over in uh, Normandy. And, uh, Okay. Like you can see that these things are not all that all that small. They roll a tank out of a loaded tank out of that takes a lot. Okay. Radio communication would be set up on the beach as soon as they landed, and that was our principal method of communication. Okay. And here's a typical uh, debarkment from a uh, uh, Higgins boat, the 30 men assault boat. Yeah. Assault teams, bazookas uh, right here, uh, another bazooka over here. Uh, here are the cliffs and people going up. Okay. Uh, one of the interesting American developments uh, was the so called duck. It was a dual drive uh, amphibious truck that had, you can't see them down here, but there are two propellers that uh, enable them to go offshore, get loaded, and go on shore. Okay. And these are, are various uh, shots. Okay. And one of the... Uh, This, fortunately, these are, are uh, not dummies, but uh, people acting out uh, uh, casualties. But you can see they have uh, gas masks on and so forth. And this is part of the exercise. Okay. Sideways, ten feet in the water. 
after a broadside. And you'd have to be there looking at the thing to say it even happened. You, you, you didn't want to believe what you were looking at. But there was so much of that that it would, uh, it could fill your mind very quickly.
first of all, they uh, had pre-planned naval gunfire. By that I mean the USS Texas and Nevada and the French uh, uh, battleship. Uh, this was the, the heavy fire that was supposed to blow all the clay boxes to King of Come. And uh, then there were cruisers and so forth. But they laid the fire on for a half an hour. And the Germans had been building concrete bunkers for five years. Uh, these bunkers were you know, three and four foot walls on them. And I'm sorry, even the 16 inch shots uh, uh, might have chipped some concrete off it uh, and shaken everybody up. But they, they didn't knock the, the pole boxes out. Um, we also had, uh, including in the invasion, uh, the naval part of it, uh, what they called rocket ships. And these were like some of the big uh, ships you saw earlier. They were in, in the belly of the, of the ship. They had racks of rockets. Uh, these were 4.2 uh, rockets. And they would be fired off in salvos, and that was impressive. I mean, there was smoke and noise, and, and up to the night. There I am, curious, down, looking all over, and I saw the arc of the rockets, and unfortunately, they landed in the water. And they killed a lot of ship, uh, fish, but they didn't do any, anything on the, uh, uh, to dampen the German enthusiasm. Um, the Air Force was supposed to uh, bomb the beaches, but in our beach, Omaha, we were supported by B-17s and B-24s. And the cloud cover was 10,000 feet, and their regulations required that uh, they fly above 10,000. So that meant they weren't going visual, they were going by radar. And when you do that, you add a safety factor. So over, over they came and uh, roaring away, and we didn't hear any bones. And three minutes later, with the, the time sequence and the, and the safety factor, they were bombing French cows and, and uh, farmhouses and whatever. In, well in there. Uh, that, so that was the other major support that never happened. Um, we had what they called duplex drive tanks, which had uh, the ability to take a, it was a British idea, that's a bad way of saying that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, they had canvas skirts that came up uh, from the body of the tank, and they had two propellers in the back, and they could drive off a, a vessel and swim ashore. So they sometimes were called swimming tanks. The first ones were launched way too far uh, offshore, and they promptly sank. I mean, promptly sank. They were over the edge and out of sight. And after seeing five or six tanks disappear, somebody with sense said, OK, stop. That's enough. Uh, we're not going to do any more of that. And they later brought them in close to the beach. and. Uh, I had one laying right beside me uh, about an hour later. But those were the mistakes that were, were made. On the German side, uh, everything started from Hitler on down. And nobody did anything unless he approved it. Now, they had some physical problems and a lot of other problems. But, uh, one of them was that he liked to sleep late at night, in the morning. Not that I have anything against that, you understand. But uh, he was, everybody was forbidden to interrupt him. So here's the battle of Normandy going on for a couple of hours, and nobody has the guts to wake him up and say, excuse me, shit, the Americans and the English are there. They finally did around noontime, and he thought that was wonderful. He had them right where they wanted, where, where he wanted. Uh, but in the meantime, the Panzer tanks were lining up the hedgerows, waiting to smash at us, and they 
the engines were turning over and nothing happened. Um, there was overlapping of command. One group couldn't tell the other what to do or something. So they had a lot of logistics, they had a lot of administrative problems on their side that matched everything that we had on ours. Our airborne, in the meantime, had landed uh, the night before around midnight on the uh, on Coden 10 Peninsula, which was off to the, the west. And uh, I was, I had been asked to uh, go on guard duty to sit beside one of the se able seamen and uh, man a 20 millimeter gun, I think it was. So we had a front row seat of everything, and watched these planes come over, and we could look up, and they were only 500 feet in the air, and you could see the lights on the inside, and, and, uh, and then off to the, uh, to the left, you could see the German anti-aircraft. It was like a sheet of, a solid sheet of tracers. All you could see was white, lines of uh, bullets going up in the air and occasional uh, anti-aircraft. Uh, but by, by the time I landed, which was around 9 o'clock in the morning, um, we had, we still had direct fire. Uh, our ship was actually destroyed on the beach and uh, had to be abandoned. But uh, all in all, we were we were lucky puppies. We we walked right up the uh, the draw in front of us and got into combat right off the bat. This was a mixed blessing because we walked into the hedgerows and uh, that was something we were not prepared for. Allied intelligence had taken photography out into light, but they had not given us a sense of how big these hedgerows were, how tall they were, were there openings in them, how did you attack them, and so forth. So it was a case of on-the-job training, and we, uh, we started out that way. The hard way, losing an awful lot of people for every yard gain in the distance between the beaches and San Juan, which was our major transportation hub that we were, was our, our core and army objective, uh, 17 miles. And my division was probably over 10,000 men in that period. For the rest of the war, we lost another 10. So we were one of the top three or four divisions in terms of if you have questions, now would be the time to ask them. I have some that I've gotten from other people from uh, various tours from the National Geographic to the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, very intelligent group and, and they wanted to know a lot of things. But I'd rather ask you uh, any questions that you might have. I'm sorry, I can't. Yeah, the question is, uh, I, I had a good fortune of uh, going to Europe in 1938. Uh, my father was an electrical engineer and a designer. He had to go to Paris to check on some patents. My brother, the year before, had gone to the World Jamboree in Volendam. Uh, my sister left Wellesley and went to Heidelberg. And so, mother looked at me one day and said, they're all gone to Europe, and you and I are left alone. That's not right. So how about going? <laughs> at 14, I thought, yeah, that's a very good idea. So <laughs> off we went, and we, we found ourselves in Bremen uh, on a wonderful August afternoon with the sun shining. And we were in the upper level of a bus that uh, took the tour around the city. And we were well into it and chatting back and forth so people sitting behind us would know obviously that we were either English or American. 
And about halfway through the journey, uh, a man reached up and tapped mother on the shoulder and said, uh, I need to talk to you right away in a very urgent sense of uh, interest. And, and mother was up to the, the challenge, so we got off at the next stop and sat out in an outdoor cafe around a little small uh, table and had lemonade or whatever. And he said, uh, I'll make this quick, I don't want to drag it out too long, but I'm Jewish and I expect to be killed in the next six months and we, uh, we got big bug eyes at that. How, how would you know that you're going to be killed and so on and so forth? But he was not joking. Uh, he said, I had friends in my neighborhood that had disappeared. And, and uh, this was 1938. So the concentration camps were up and running. He had two sisters in Florida. And he said, all I would ask of you, and it's a lot to ask, that you, you would write to them and tell them they're all, all right, but don't expect to hear from them. And so Mother said, yes, we certainly will do that. And she wrote to him. And uh, four or five months later, uh, one of the sisters in Florida wrote and said, uh, our mail is being returned from Hans, or whatever his name was. Uh, so he's disappeared off. He, he's gone to the concentration camps. This but that gave me a sense of, we had a whole series of films for young men to come in and see what we were fighting for because there were a lot of kids that were, I, I grew up in Massachusetts and we were very, not international so much as, we were well aware of what was going on with all the colleges around there. You could get, you could get lectures at, at a moment's notice about anything. There were plays on Broadway and so forth. Um, but uh, we were more world aware than somebody in Kansas. No offense to anybody from Kansas. <laughs> but, uh, it was uh, it was an eye opener for me. And when the time came up, as we were going through basic training and saw one film after another, people would ask me, "Is that for real? Did that happen?" And I could say, "Yeah." From First hand, I know that it, it was. And it was only later as we got into the war that we saw the, uh, the many atrocities that happened to our soldiers uh, with their wrist bone shot through the head and all the rest of it. Uh, that it began to sink in on a lot of Americans. But we were not a nation brought up to hate people. We were taught to respect our neighbors. And when we went to World War I to end all wars, we left and pulled out and uh, left the, uh, the division of the spoils to the English and the, uh, the French who had suffered so much. Any other? Yep. In the display that uh, the staff has put on for you and you've had a chance to look at it, you'll notice that there's one framed document that uh, if you look at it closely, it's a, a medieval journal. And uh, I had two years in high school, two years in college, a year and a half of German, so I could read and write pretty well. And uh, one morning on the World River in Germany, uh, cold, rainy, snowy, muddy, miserable. Uh, we were in a burnt out chateau that was we were in the cellar where it was nice and warm. And I went out for a walk in the formal English garden with the little privet hedges and all. And there in the gravel walkway was a square piece of paper. And I thought, how did it ever last all the rain and snow and so forth? So I went over and picked it up. And obviously it was uh, velvet. And it would withstand all the bad weather. So I unfolded it carefully. And there was this four-inch square of the most beautiful hand illumination I had ever seen. And, and it, the colors were absolutely perfect. And I struggled through the, the text somewhat, 
but I could recognize that it was something to do with Maximilian. And uh, so I shook the water off and put it away, sent it back to Harvard to the uh, Houghton Museum that deals in real books. And after the war, I came back and went up to the desk and said, uh, could I have somebody translate this uh, manuscript because I, I, I can't make all the words up. And there was a man standing behind me and he said, I'm Professor Smith. And I, I can tell you what it is. It's a, a grant of nobility to uh, Maximilian of uh, Austria. And uh, oh, that, that's interesting. And uh, I, I left it with him thinking I would get a translation back. And six months later, I got a nice letter from Harvard saying, thank you for your gift. <laughs> uh, probably is just as well there because they had the means to take care of it and so forth. And, uh, but it was after we had scheduled some trips to Germany, and particularly in the Jewel, where the, uh, uh, where the museum was, that uh, the, uh, the, our guide, a British, uh, British man, graduate of Oxford and Cambridge and so forth, very, very intelligent man. He, uh, he contacted the mayor of uh, Julek and said, we'd like to come over and, and meet with your people. And, oh, by the way, we have a manuscript uh, of uh, grant of nobility, and we'd like to bring it over to you. Well, they had given us a city, yeah, because the, the city had been flattened, and this was one of the rare, rare pieces of history that was going to be brought back to it. And uh, we went over and gave it, gave it to the mayor, and uh, uh, they were very gracious, and we had lunch and a tour of the place and so forth. But when you, you go back and look at it, you'll see that hand illumination that I talked about. That's a Polaroid copy of it. But and I don't know whether the, the seal that went with it uh, was included in the picture. But as a point of reference, that, that goes back to the 15th century. So you're looking at a piece of history that is uh, unique, and thanks to a college education and the ability to recognize a valuable manuscript which gets saved, and there it is on display out in your, in your uh, hallway. Have I put you all asleep? <laughs> Near misses. Well, in, in combat, there are there are an awful lot of chances to get uh, shot at because that's the whole enemy purpose is to shoot as often as they can. So when I was first made squad leader right after the landing, my squad leader was in um, I got inherited a pair of binoculars and I was up in the hedgerows, and I thought I was well covered. And I had the binoculars up trying to look for any signs of Germans. And my my uh, shirt lost out on either side. And uh, the sniper put the bullet right through there. Now that's, that's awfully close for company. Uh, I've had, uh, in close air support, I've had a P-47 uh, Two five hundred pound bombs, twenty yards away from me, because we had three. We I had three soldiers to guard two hundred prisoners, and I think he saw the prisoners, but they didn't see us, and so he dropped in. And, uh, I was carrying a carbine with a rifle grenade on the top of it, and it was an impact grenade. So I I knelt down, put the rifle beside me, and the grenade was right beside my head. And I remember looking over and seeing these two bombs coming in, and the frozen curve came flying through the air, and one big chunk landed right on top of the grenade, but there was not enough weight to, to set it off. So uh, that was, I, you're supposed to catch it in nine lives. Uh, I, I think I went through more than that. Bombers that uh, shot at us in the, uh, on the roads and so forth. 
get used to it. I got wounded four times, but uh, uh, this one in the yellow was a rifle grenade, and here's my heart, went close to it. You get very circumspect about it. it uh, if, you, if you don't have a major wound, and none of mine were major, they were either rifle grenade or, or more of a round or something like that. Uh, the tendency was to turn your back uh, to uh, the front lines as quick as I could because they needed everybody they could get in the front lines. What was your unit? My unit was uh, the 29th, the, the National Guard was the adjunct to the regular army. Uh, before the war, we had a, I think the 17th smallest military in the world. I mean, that meant that uh, Swahili or somebody had, had more troops than we did. But in short order, we went up to 16 million. So the, the, the wonder of American industry and administrative ability and so forth lay in the fact that they could take this vast amount of men, process them, and when, and, and process them and get them ready in the units and train them and send them overseas. Uh, beside the rather small regular army was the National Guard and they were, they numbered about uh, 20. And the 29th Division came from Maryland and Virginia. And uh, I was in the 115th, which, which was uh, Frederick, Maryland, and the, uh, everybody knew everybody else. That was the, that's a difficulty, probably it's true of any unit. If you're the new man coming in, you are the new man whether you like it or not. Uh, it didn't take long to change, and that frankly was the reason why I went up the ladder. I was a squad leader within three weeks because my squad leader got wounded. I was a uh, section leader, two squads shortly after that, acting for two sergeant, and then when I was in Britain after I got out of the, uh, uh, out of the German hands, I, they came in and said, we'd like to make you a lieutenant. But that was because openings were made all along the line. I was captured. When the breakout from Normandy came, uh, it was truly a breakout. General Patton came on the scene with all his tanks, and he turned to the east, and he just went out for leather as fast and as far as he could go, and uh, left everybody else hanging by their thumbs. One corps was sent to the west to take care of the fortress of, uh, at Brest in Brittany, and uh, there, was, there, was, there was a German corps there, uh, tanks and power, uh, third paratroop division, and various other, and the, the maritime, the, the naval contingent there. So it, it had enough troops to, and fortifications to be very difficult. And, uh, on one occasion, I, I, I was so with machine guns, and I went forward to the platoon to take a pillbox. And uh, we secured the area, and that was fine. But then it became <clears throat> obvious that we were in a very vulnerable position. We could be surrounded very easily. So I had a couple of wounded at that time. We, Traveled out with 45 and then out with 13. Um, so around noontime, when it was real quiet, I took I think one or two of the, the wounded back with me, and I sat down with the battalion commander and I said, uh, Sir, you've got to help us one way or the other. You either send reinforcements or pull us out of there, because I have a handful of people to hold two pillboxes and a whole maze of trenches. And I don't have enough men. Simple as that. So I'll leave that up to you and I grab some more ammo and went back to my people. Well, they sort of sent some replacements over, but they never got there. And, uh, uh, 
the rest of the day dragged down. And when it became dark, uh, I, I couldn't see out of one eye because of water had gone. Water blast close by. So I'm kind of peeking around the pillbox to see if I could see any Germans. And all of a sudden, I felt something in the back of my back. And it felt very much like a, uh, a weapon of some sort. In a very quiet, nice voice, said, you please put your hands up. That's a good start. I put my buckles down and put my hands up and turned around. Here was a living epitome of German Aryans. It was Hitler's honesty made true. He was blonde, blue-eyed, um, built like a tough guy. He had great big shoulders and a narrow waist. And he was a paratroop lieutenant. And he said, you'll go around and get your men to surrender. And I said, oh, I think that's a good idea. And so I, I got them all together and we were marched off to the submarine and, and the uh, we, we had concrete floor to lie on and that was it. We got meals twice a day and uh, the first or second day, I was I was the senior non-com in the group, and uh, they called me in for interrogation. And uh, the captain and a, and a master sergeant were there, and he uh, he was a graduate of Oxford and Cambridge, and he spoke better English than I did. And uh, what was more disconcerting, he took out a map and he said. Well, you landed here, and you went there, and you went there, and, and here you are here, and you're here with the, uh, the 115th of it. I felt like saying, don't you want to ask me any questions? And that just cleared the deck that said, uh, we know all about you, so there really isn't anything we need to know. Uh, but uh, after a brief interrogation, I, we went back, and, and uh, sat in our room waiting. We went through on Air Force Street, and that was, you could hear it as a rumble, not, not anything more, because these southern pattern walls were eight and ten feet thick. And, uh, there was one hole in the, in the roof in one place where one of the Germans said a whole string of bombs landed one right after the other on the same place, and finally had busted through a four foot wide hole. Eventually, the door squeaked open, and there was an army medic, and uh, he said, you're free to go. Where were we going to go? And I just head that way, and we'll run into somebody. Well, I uh, we were out on the road, the upper road. This was, we were down in the depths with the submarine pens. And as I was walking down the road, here came up a battalion commander. And the last time I had talked to him was to say, if you don't help me, we're in deep trouble. So I gave him my best salute and he walked right by me. And I thought, <laughs> no, that's not in the field, man. You're supposed to be kind to me and say, I, I think I let you down. And uh, could you forgive me? Or, there was none of that. It was just, uh, he walked right by me. So I realized that. I was under some suspicion. And being captured is not a, it's quite a traumatic experience. You, you're not ready for, you feel that you've given up something. I don't know how to put it any better than that. But it was, it was a difficult transition to go through. When I was brought right back to the battalion, they asked a few questions, and uh, that's when they offered me the battalion, uh, the battlefield commission, which I think was the battalion command's way of saying, "Yeah, we screwed up, and we're going to make you a lieutenant, so be happy and let it go." Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, I've been back a number of times uh, 
eight times with the Smithsonian and the... Uh, but they were pretty well confined to Normandy, which is where the majority of the troops had served. But an equal number were just as interested in Germany and so forth. So uh, that was a chance where I could, I could see the houses where I was in and so forth. Yeah. The uh, one aside from that was that uh, various Germans, you couldn't find a Nazi for looking. Uh, nobody would admit to anything. Adolf Hitler? Uh, Hitler? No, I haven't heard that name. Uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty ridiculous. But uh, anyway, uh, we took over one house which was obviously a, uh, a Nazi official and a rather rotund man. And he just pulled out the pants and they put around you twice. And, uh, but it, the house was the first house we had been in in a long time. And I was standing out on the front porch one day and uh, some of the, the concentration camp people were trickling through. They had evidently gone through some sort of a, uh, an examination, a de or whatever. And here were two young men, I, I, Rick Mark and some of the young men coming in today, they were about that size, six, six feet, some of them, and, uh, but they were rags. Literally, the, the, the pants were in in rag, and they looked very much under threat and so forth, and I said to the sentry, go over and get those two guys. And they could speak English as most uh, Scandinavians or English or whatever. And I said, uh, you, you just camped from Camp Dora, which was the concentration camp that we had liberated in, uh, which is a horror story on the so. But uh, brought them in and uh, I said to the cook, you're going to feed them the bare minimum, you know, a two teaspoon at a time, mainly some soup, thick soup, and nothing more. If they look at uh, anything else, you're going to slap them on the wrist and say, that's it, or until the doctor came in and examined And uh, then I went upstairs to the the closet of the, of the, the Nazi official, the beautiful local cloth and jackets and all the rest of them. Hooked up this and that and the other thing. And I said, what the one? It, it was laughable. It was once around for me, twice around for them. The poor kids, it, they, it, it was like trying to fit on a balloon. But uh, we got some rope and tied the pants to it, it nice and warm. And it sure beat the rags that they had. Uh, and the jacket was so it hung on the roof of one. And I said, you're going to stay here for a couple of days and get your strength back and then, then you can be on your way. Well, their strength came back quickly and they walked downtown. And they walked somewhere where the owner of the pole could see them. And it wasn't 10 minutes later that this great big fat guy came pounding up to the door. And the sentry said, well, sir, there's somebody out here to see you. And I said, well, who is it? He said, I think it's the owner of the house. And uh, he was no mood to waste around uh, waiting to talk to uh, uh, somebody of importance. And I came out, and I wasn't pleasant, but I wasn't snarling at him either. But he said, you American criminals don't know right from wrong. You have no sense. You're all from Chicago and you're gangsters and, and I don't know why we let you conquer our country. And that began to get under my skin a little bit. That's putting it mildly. And uh, I said, why are you here to tell me that? I already know who's the criminal and who's the the gangster. And he said, well, I saw my clothing go by. Yeah. And I said, uh, it's put to good use for concentration camp people who came by here in rags. 
So I said, unless you have something else to say, I'm going to ask you to leave right now. And in order to help you, and he was at the top of the stairs, I gave him the biggest kick I had that I could. And he bounced down the stairs, lusted away, and went home to have a beer. Or <laughs> that was my inner reaction with, uh, with some of the Germans. They, they range from very good to very poor. Uh, I didn't want to get clocked crosswise with the, the short stop of the SS. Uh, they were Hitler's bodyguards and they were killed at the drop of a hat. And we ran in the room, unfortunately, on the room table. Uh, very difficult people. Uh, it was going to take a lot, many years of, of uh, military occupation and feeding them and doing the rest. And then when the wall came down, and the Eastern the communists came in and saw what the counterparts in the West were being fed and how their buildings were being renewed and they had jobs and all the rest of it. And it became obvious to a majority of Germans by that time that uh, uh, there was a good side and a bad side. And the sooner they got on board, the better. Okay, I've run out of gas. I, I talk a lot, and I'm sorry that uh, I took so long. Not at all. Please join me in thanking. Well, you're looking at it. <laughs> you're looking at it like a 